In this video I will be making a new workbench. If you want me to start building immediately feel free to skip ahead to this part of the video. But if you're interested I thought I would talk a little bit about why I'm making a new bench and uh, my design choices for the new one. When I was moving into this place it felt really small because I actually had a slightly larger shop before this. Uh, it was a shared space but still I had a little bit more room so it felt rather cramped in here and I designed a bench that seemed appropriately sized for this space. 155 centimeters long, about 5 feet I believe. It's a fully functional size, you can build a lot of things on it and of course you have to take your space into account when you are designing your work surfaces. But I am constantly finding myself frustrated with the size. You know when I have a shooting board on here that's taking up like a third of the bench and then I have a stack of parts and some other tools and that's the entire bench covered. Part of me realizes that with a bigger bench I would just put more tools on it and it would still be covered but I naively hope that um, I will feel less frustrated with a slightly longer bench. I am planning this one to be 200 and 20 centimeters I believe. Two, two and a half feet longer. It's it's a major upgrade from this. The height, it's just down to you know how tall you are, how tall bench you want to have, but this one is 85. I think I'm going to go slightly lower, maybe like 82, 83, because this feels just a tiny bit too tall. But yeah, apart from the length, there are also a few other issues. This is a sliding dead man. You can put a peg in here so that a board that is held for edge planing in the face wise has something to rest on. I use this quite often but it is not a good addition to a bench that also has a lot of storage in it. If any of these drawers is open a tiny bit it hits. When it's here I can't access any of these drawers and when it's here I can't access this door so it's just constantly in the way. I think either a storage cabinet underneath the bench or a sliding dead man can be great additions to a bench but having both was not a good idea. I also really dislike this tail vise. It works, it gets the job done but I hate having a piece of metal on my bench. I can't clamp anything that's thinner than like 20 millimeters here, which is a huge downside. I would have to recess it much deeper to get it below the surface and then make a wooden jaw. Even if I did that, I would have a very short travel here. And that short travel is also the reason why I have this weird setup with some square and some round holes here because at first I had a different tailwise here that had a much longer travel so I spaced my square holes 150 millimeters or so and uh, when I changed to this one I was too lazy to chop square ones so I just drilled round holes here. They are actually still not even the correct spacing for this vise so some pieces are too long to use this hole and too short to use this hole so I still have to use a spacer and that is just so unnecessary. I can do a better job with that if I start over. I also can't use holdfasts which is something I really would like to do. This is made of softwood so I think the holes would wear out very quickly and more importantly there's a whole cabinet in the way. You can't put anything through the bench top without hitting drawer bottoms. And yeah I really want to use holdfasts so I'm gonna make sure I can do that in the new bench. So now I think let's have a look at the drawing to see what I'm going to do to remedy all these mistakes and build a better bench. Here is the drawing I've made. You can see how it's a much more hobo inspired style with chunky legs and a wide rail which I've actually placed all the way down on the floor to maximize the space below the bench top. I've also added a wagon vise which I chose over a moving block vise because it would be easier to construct and a tool well because I plan to put this bench out from the wall in the middle of the room so I want the well to stop things from rolling off the back. This stuff is just an example of some random storage and I won't be building that in this video but this thing just under the bench top is important. 
This is basically what will replace the sliding dead man and it's a beam with hold fast holes that is set back slightly from the edge to allow a row of bench dogs in front of it. I also made a drawing of the tail vise because it has some fiddly geometry but it's really just a screw that pushes a block with an angled dog hole in it. I also just want to say one last thing before we start. I will be using my old bench to build the new one. It feels like cheating in a way, but this is not my first bench and if you are looking at building your first one, this design is not one that I would recommend. I'm making this after building up a preference for a few years and I'm hoping to get decades of daily use out of it. That is not the goal with your first bench. You really just want to put together something sturdy and not worry about all the features. You'll figure out what you want to add later and use that first bench to build your second. That is when it might be time to consider something like what I'm making in this video. And with that I think we are ready to start working. And I chose to begin with the legs. This is birch and finding these solid 90 by 145 millimeter chunks was actually the starting point of this new bench idea. As always it begins with flattening a face and squaring an edge, then bringing the opposite face and edge into parallel. I chose to spend some extra time sawing away the material here instead of planing as I thought this would make a quite nice thick veneer for some other project. Then I sawed the legs to length and picked one to lay out the cuts for the leg vise on. A massive mortise needs to be made for the crisscross mechanism, so I bored out the bulk of the waist with my largest auger bit. I'll be reusing the leg vise hardware that you can see mounted in the old bench here, and much of the installation was identical to the first time I did it. But back then I built up this mortise by laminating blocks together. This time I wanted to cut it out of solid stock which is more work for sure, but also far more satisfying when finished. It was a lot of chopping after the drilling, and then I flattened the floor with my 78, as the mortise is deeper than my router plane can go. Being able to move the blade to the forward position to plane almost all the way into a corner is a neat trick this tool can do. Then I measured out where the hole for the screw will go. Next up I need to make some bow ties as there are a few big cracks in the leg pieces. I used oak for this for a little bit of contrast. I sketched their rough position as a guide for where to put masking tape and then knifed around the bow ties through the tape. Not only does this make it easier to see the lines, but I seem to get cleaner results from it. I think the tape helps to hold the fibers in place as they are being cut and protects against some uh, micro tearing and bruising. Then I could glue them in and these both serve to prevent the cracks from opening further and to just, you know, look pretty sweet. I wouldn't do purely decorative inlay on a workbench, but if I have to do structural inlay, it might as well be decorative. I really like the combo of the coarse oak and the smooth birch. This next part is one of the stretchers. This is pine and we are not done adding more wood species yet. There is a whole forest in this bunch. Anyway, you know the drill, no board is left unflattened. Then I'll measure and mark where the legs are going to join in. This will become a T-bridle 
which is a joint with a lot of shoulder area and therefore very strong against racking. This joint is used on the two back legs below the tool well, but I'll be doing something different on the front legs. Still working with pine because I had some suitable stock, this will become the lower short stretchers. You certainly don't have to agree with me here, but I think a piece of clear grain heartwood pine has a lot of beauty despite reputation. I milled it up and this time I'll be making mortise and tenon joints. These thicker pieces are the upper short stretchers and here I laid out a large dovetail. to positioning these parts and it really doesn't matter too much so I just made sure to place them to the side of any cracks so the mortise goes into solid stock. Next I had to lay out the tenon at the top of the two front legs that will go into the bench top eventually. That is because these tenons extend above the upper stretcher so that big dovetail I made earlier will have to be let in into the shoulder of these tenons. You'll see this in just a moment. Ah here we go. The back leg to the right in this shot is cut to just butt up against the underside of the bench top. But on the front leg we have the tenon, so the dovetail is scribed onto the tenon shoulder. With the joints fitting, the last thing I'll do to these upper stretchers is add a few shallow mortises. This is part of how the bench top will attach to the base. It's time to add the long stretcher to the front legs and I need to have an offset here as the right leg is set behind the row of dog holes while the left leg is flush with the bench top edge. Because of this offset I'll have to make half lap joints for these which will also give plenty of shoulder area for racking resistance but will have to be bolted together in the final assembly. Now that everything has been checked for fit, I could glue up each pair of legs. The bench will at some point need to be disassembled, so I kept that in mind when planning out how it'll go together. The short stretchers are glued in place, while the long stretchers and the bench top will be held with screws, weight and friction. 
With that, all parts of the base were done and it was time to move on to the bench top. This is a soft maple and I ripped these flat on boards into approximately two and a half inch wide strips to stand on edge and effectively give a quarter sawn slab when laminated. I didn't really flatten these, figuring they are long enough to simply bend into flat when pressed together, so I just smoothed them to prep for glue. So yeah, here the top goes together, and I really wished I had more of these aluminium bar clamps, but I made do, and as I had hoped, all the boards straightened out and all the joints closed up. For now I'll just flatten the underside. This electric planer is a real lifesaver in this whole project. It would of course be perfectly doable with a scrub plane, but this video would probably be another month away if I had gone full unplugged. It is noisy and throws dust everywhere and leaves a terrible surface, but it's actually really efficient on the battery, just keeps on going and going. That's more than can be said for my scrawny arms when hand planing. And of course it doesn't really change the workflow at all. You still have to check your progress with the winding sticks and hit the high spots and not go too far. So it's not like a machine like this is a replacement for technique and practice. If I didn't know how to flatten a board with a scrub plane, I wouldn't know how to do it with an electric one. So with a flat face and a straight edge, I could cut the bench top to length in preparation for the end cap joinery. I'll be making a sort of super short and wide tenon that will keep the top flat while allowing it to shrink as it continues to dry out over many years. I love this skew blade, a Japanese plane for flattening large tenons across the grain. It goes right up into the corner and leaves a beautiful surface. Then I cut off some excess length and used the shoulder of the joint to measure out the locations of my dog holes. This first square line is for the wagon vise slot. Then I scribed the dog holes with a 3 degree angle. This is done so the top of the bench dog contacts the workpiece first, which sounds like it would be a bad thing, but there is always a little bit of flex in the system, and I've found that with perfectly plumb dogs, the workpiece has a tendency to lift up off the bench. When you then go to hand plane it, the piece can slip out of the grip. Angling the dogs towards each other prevents this issue. To saw these cuts, I made a jig for the circ saw. It looks square, but actually has that 3 degree angle. I also used my truly square square to make the cuts for the leg mortise and the wagon vise slot. By the way, I want to mention my use of gloves throughout this video. We had some wild temperature swings here during the build of this bench, with cold snaps and snowfall well into spring. I really don't like to work with gloves, but some mornings I'd come out here and the tools were so cold they hurt to touch. Then I'm editing this video during a sudden heat wave, so it feels really jarring that I'm dressed for winter in these shots. I even found these knitted fingerless mittens in a charity shop. They were super nice for like a week before the weather turned tropical. Anyway, here I'm making a step in the dog holes so the dogs can be pushed down but not fall through.
Here I'm flattening the pocket for the wagon vise. I want this extremely smooth so the vise moves effortlessly. For the end caps I chose oak. I see a lot of people using walnut here for the contrast, which is pretty cool, but it seemed a bit over the top for my taste. Oak feels more utilitarian and in my opinion more suitable for shop furniture and I like the more subtle contrast better too. On the flattened inside face I marked the long mortise that will trap the bench top and help with holding it flat. Then I needed the front edge and this is beech. The only reason for that is because I didn't have enough of the soft maple but beech should make for a very durable edge and the color is similar so I don't mind. I need to make a pocket for the tail vise here as well and this time I made a bunch of cuts to depth to easily bust out the waist while leaving a few bridges that the router plane can ride on. with some minimal smoothing that should leave the surface as close as possible to coplanar with the board base. Next up it's dovetail time. I decided against houndstooth tails here, again because it felt a little bit too fancy. I know the houndstooth tails technically might be a little bit stronger, but I just like the look of a couple of big long dovetails and no fuss, and I don't think the strength difference is enough to matter to be honest. Anyway a Japanese saw is great here, as this long board has to be held horizontally. Another way would be to put it on a low saw bench and use a tenon saw or panel saw that way. Then I knifed the baseline and dovetail shapes onto the pinboard, which is the oak end cap. Another thing that needs to be done before assembling the benchtop edges is to make the tool well. Here I'm flattening a piece of spruce. I don't think this needs to be anything more durable than that as it's at the back edge and not really subject to abuse. I marked the shoulders off of the benchtop and then cut more dovetails. With the sockets done I need to make a groove here that the floor of the tool well can rest in. This will work sort of as a floating panel that is not attached to the bench top so things can move without cracking. Here I'm cutting the tongue at the end of the tool well floor that will go into the groove. The two parts of the tool well then gets glued together. Then 
Then the final step before I can glue on the edges is to make the tail vise. Here I'm laying out and cutting a slot for the screw. The hardware for this is something I found on an old workbench at a yard sale. The bench itself was junk, but I got it for the vice parts. There's no brand on it, but you can make something very similar just with a threaded rod and a large nut. Keep in mind that you'll want a left hand thread if you want to tighten the vice clockwise. Then comes the wagon part of the vise. This is an offcut from the beach front edge. This also needs a bit of work to make everything fit. Then it also needs a dog hole of course, and this time I couldn't do the saw and laminate technique, so I drilled it out and chopped it square. To join the block to the hardware I needed to drill some holes for fasteners. I made one hole with a countersink for a wood screw. And one threaded hole for a machine screw. This metal was soft enough that I felt it could safely be tapped with a drill. The wood screw goes into the wagon block like so, and then it's time to make a plywood piece that will stabilize the block vertically. I'm attaching it with screws so the vise can be disassembled if ever needed. And this is why I needed that threaded hole. I also have to make an opening for the dog. I've never talked this much about dogs in a video before. Why are they even called that? I'm more of a cat person anyway. The screw also needs to pass through the end cap, so here I'm boring a hole for that. Bit oversized, I'll stabilize the screw later. And finally it is assembly time. The vice parts are held in place like so, and then I began gluing everything together. The oak end caps are glued onto the beach front edge, and the front edge is glued to the maple bench top, but there is no glue between the oak and maple. That way the top can shrink and expand as it wishes, while it is held flat by the end caps. The tool well is also glued to the end caps, but not to the maple part. So the overall width of the bench will always remain consistent, and a small gap between the bench top and tool well floor accommodates the wood movement. Now the top just needs one more mortise for the right front leg. I marked the leg position off of the stretcher, then aligned the leg with this mark and scribed around the tenon. While I had it upside down I also made these rails that will trap the wagon vise to complete the vertical stabilization. I put some candle wax on the bearing surfaces and then put the block and rails in place.
The tool well outside was cleaned up, I saved that for now so I could plane it flush with the dovetail pins at the same time. And then I began putting the base together. This is all held with gravity, friction and a few screws so it can be taken apart. I don't plan a move anytime soon, but a build like this has to be future proofed. So at this point I could actually start using the bench, and that's good because the old one had to go before I could assemble the new one. Here I'm making buttons that will attach the top to the base, this is why I made those small mortises in the upper rails way back in the build. With the top firmly held down, I sawed the leg tenons flush, and then I started the long process of flattening the top. The power planer knocked down the worst of the high spots, and was followed by the number 7 both across and along the grain. You can see the bench rocking a bit here, that's because the floor in my shop is very uneven, and that's something I'll have to live with for now. The front edge needed a little bit of tweaking to get it square with the top. And then I decided to make a couple of temporary dogs. I really want a face vise before making small parts like this. But to make the face vise, I had to get the tail vise operational. This is a chunk of oak left over from the Live Edge dining table project. It was too discolored and gnarly to use there, but it'll be perfect for a leg vise chop. It's a bit thin though, so I glued a bit more thickness onto it. Then I flattened the outside and flushed up the edges. Using the mortise in the leg, I marked the corresponding cutout onto the chop, and also the hole for the lead screw. Then I squared these lines by referencing the center line of the chop, since the edges are angled. A hole this big in oak is a bit of a workout. The mortise was done in the same way as in the leg. Then I put the bearing plate in place. The installation of the bench crafted crisscross and vice screw is mostly the same as the first time I did it, so for more details on that I'd suggest my old bench build video. Here's something I did differently though. I tapped threads into these holes this time rather than just drive the screws in since I'm using harder wood for the chop now. Then I just followed the instructions that came with the parts on how to center the screw and the nut.
This bushing that stabilizes the lead screw side to side was installed exactly the same as the first time I did it. After flushing up the end I cut a bevel into it and this time I did it closer to 60 degrees than 45 as I found the 45 degree angle on my old chop sometimes got in the way when sewing half blind dovetails and such. And this time I decided to actually use the piece of suede that came with the vise. I never glued it in place last time for whatever reason. Only on the chop though, not on the leg. I don't want the protrusion from the bench edge and it provides no shortage of grip even if only applied to the chop. So with a functioning leg vise available again I can make a handle for the tail vise. I finished it up by attaching a split plate around the screw to stabilize it in the most friction free position. And then it's time for dogs. So many dogs, one for every hole. I'm not doing any springs or anything fancy, they stay in place by friction. So I'm looking for a very specific fit where they can be pushed up easily but don't fall down again. Then I faced them all with the cutoffs of suede from the leg vise. The point of having a dog in every hole is twofold. Firstly, it's convenient to not have to move them around and search when they get lost. There's just always a dog right where it's needed. Secondly, it keeps the holes plugged so they don't fill up with sawdust. And as a bonus, with each dog fitted individually to its hole, I can get that tight fit that I want on every single one, which might not be possible if I had a universal dog that could go anywhere since the holes are in the end handmade and not perfectly identical. Then a bit of flattening and the tailwise system is complete. The final part of the bench is the beam that will fill the role that the sliding dead man had previously. This piece of pine comes from the old bench top, lending some sort of poetic link if you will between the new bench and its predecessor. It gets glued just behind the dogs. It effectively doubles the thickness of the bench top here where most of the work gets done and also gives a place to drill holes for hold fasts. I haven't used these before but have heard good things about the Gramercy Tools version so I ordered a couple and a 3 quarter inch drill bit for the job. I spaced them so they can reach anywhere along the edge and positioned them vertically a bit towards the top of the beam to give them the best reach and also surround them with as much wood as possible. 
In the top I pushed them back to where they can just reach the front edge. The spacing is not exactly so they can reach anywhere, that would put a bit too many holes in the bench for my liking, but they have pretty good coverage when spaced 20 centimeters or 8 inches apart like this. I can always add more holes if I have to, but I want to keep it to a minimum to not compromise the strength of the bench top. And wow do they work. This feature alone makes the entire bench build worth it. Absolutely revolutionary work holding method. This will make so many operations easier. So with that, thank you very much for watching this insanely long video and thank you for waiting for it. The next one will be a bit shorter. I'll see you later.